Hey, welcome to a fire engineering hub day hangout uh, with Traditions Training and in the International Society of Fire Service Instructors. And, uh, and of course, as always, the boss is here, uh, Bobby Halton. And uh, we got our, our gang on here. Uh, they're all getting to cameras now. Um, usually, I'm the one that should be on ca off camera because I have a face for radio. Um, but I'm just still admiring Sammy's hat. So I'm getting a little distracted right now. So, but. Uh, today, today's show is, is something that I've been wanting to talk about for, uh, for a couple of weeks. And I, I wish Chief Heller was on and, and, you know, Tony Carroll was on. We got Mike Richardson for, for uh, the International Society of Fire Service Instructors on. But it's about company officer decision making. And uh, Chief Schultz is hopefully will be joining us. He was finishing up, finishing up some union negotiations in, in Anne Arundel County. But it's been a problem that's been plaguing uh, a couple of departments uh, around us is um, – how dependent we are on the company officer and and, and that's a good thing so um you know the, the company officers have to make a bunch of decisions uh, very nice what, what we're finding is sometimes is that you know th those decision making is a little bit flawed um and that's because i think that we don't train them enough or give them enough education of what we need to do so i'm you know i'm not saying that the company officer is flawed by a far stretch so um, I think that's something that I, I tried to focus on my last couple of years in Florida was the company officer, um, just how important he is to the incident commander about that feedback that they get back. So, look, before we get going on the roundtable, you know, let's get an update uh, from fire engineering. What's going on, man? It's we're in August now. So hey, we got we got so many things going on. I don't know where to begin. Our, our, our new micro learning site launches tomorrow, which will be phenomenal. So it's basically. Uh, you know, two minute drills uh, we, we loaded like three or 400 of them. We're going to be continually adding to them. Obviously, we, you know, Sam and Ricky and Mike, we're going to be asking, you know, guys like you with areas of expertise that are, you know, amazing to do it. It's kind of cool. So each little drill is like less than some of them are 90 seconds. Some of them might go like go two minutes and it, it's so and it's right on your phone. So, you know, when people need to go out and do drill. You, they can drill on their own. They can drill with their team. They got it right there. So kind of cool little micro learning thing we're launching. We got all kinds of stuff going on with the new fire engineering, uh, the university thing we've got going that, that that's taken off and archiving some webcast stuff up there doing, you know, course development. And so that's going to be just blowing up. Uh, the show is like cranking. We're got, everybody's getting recommitted and set back up and we're working through all that stuff. And so that's looking fantastic. And, uh, you know, we're, we're doing really great things there. We're growing. we got a couple of new people that came on board lately for fire brass emergency equipment, which is really, really cool. So that, that, that's going to blow up. That's a really great deal. And so it's just a great time to be in the fire service. The other thing we noticed was that, you know, face-to-face -face human connection and, and interchange, having a place to go, you know, being able to go sit down at a table, having lunch and dinner with people from around the country is so important because there's so much that's happened in the last 18 months or so innovation wise whether it has to do with, you know, laminated glass, whether it has to do with gas detection, whether it has to do with just a myriad of topics that we, we, what I've discovered is that the, the internet's fine, but the internet is really kind of constrained to what is known. And, and it doesn't really lend itself really well to that innovation point where people get to kind of, you know, dig down a little on the gouge and pull out what they really need to pull out. And that really only happens when we're like kind of face to face when we can actually like almost touch one another, you know what I mean? And so it's really exciting to see that the, uh, the and, and thank God the COVID numbers are dropping across the country. You know, it's a precipitous drop off. Just amazing here in, in my state of Oklahoma, we're down, you know, into double digits and in, in new cases every day and which is wonderful. Texas is experiencing the same thing. I know the East Coast is kind of lagging behind as the East Coast tends to do in most things. But um, the, the so that's just a wonderful blessing and thank God for that. And we're seeing, you know, that the treatment modalities are just being you know, upgraded every day. And now there's three vaccines. And so just, just fantastic. This is fantastic news on all fronts. Cause I think people really just need to get back to being people. Um, and, 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 and no disrespect to face diapers. You know, I've seen all kinds of great face diapers out there, but it'd be wonderful not to wear a face diaper everywhere we go anymore. And, you know, the, the, it, it, so it, it, I, I'm, I'm very grateful for that and grateful for everybody for hanging in with us. Got a bunch of new books in the queue coming out and, um, so that's wonderful. Our friends with the uh, Instructor Society are doing all kinds of great new stuff with us. And we're going to be meeting at FDIC and talking about some new stuff we're going to be doing there. So just 
Thank you for all your patience through all this. The new websites are up. We hope you're enjoying those. We think they're very, very cool. So uh, please go to Fire Engineering or, or Fire Brass Emergency Equipment or Firefighter Nation. Uh, Gems, check out the new look and feel. We think they're very cool. So we appreciate that. And um, can't wait to talk about the company officer. And I couldn't, I couldn't imagine a better group of people if we're going to talk about company officers than the, than the gang we got today. So thank you for the little commercial break. And, uh, and thank you for traditions and the society for putting this together every month. We, we really do value you. And, 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 uh, and, and on a personal note, I love your characters. And thanks for doing this for us. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah, I, miss, I missed last week. That second COVID shot took me down, man. So I, I couldn't even, I couldn't get on at all. So, but so I'm going to try to start off. So Donnie, well, I'm going to try. One, yes, one sir, Bobby. Thing, I'm sorry. Just so I can tell yep. Ricky and, and the gang, um, I'm in my second week of recovery. My treatments ended two weeks ago. So thank, thank you everybody for sticking with me the last year as I went through this. And uh, obviously the last eight months were the, were unbelievable. But uh, made it to the other side, and uh, God willing, that the, you know, start getting results back in about eight weeks, and and then uh, it'll do what it what it was supposed to do. But thank you for everybody dealing with my chemo brain. I know from time to time it was like, didn't we just tell him that like ten minutes ago? <laughs> and chemo brain's a real thing. If you have a friend who was ever going through that shit, man, be kind because it's weird. It's it's a weird it's a weird thing. I kept trying to explain that to my wife when I would come home with ladies from the bar, but I'm just kidding. I'm just that's a joke. But thank so, you. So so now you're back up. You're back up to 12 miles on the treadmill every day. You know. I only do 10. That... I, I went down to 10, but I do do okay. I do uh, I do 60 minutes on the total gym and 60 minutes on the uh, elliptical every day. And you so, do that on purpose. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's my that's me time, man. That's me time. That, that that's my favorite part of the day. But I wanted to say thank you for your prayers and, and your thoughts and your your well wishes and and uh, um, it, it, it meant the world to me and uh, so so thank you everybody and and I made it. So so Donnie, I, I'm going to let you kind of start. So I kind of I let it off. I know you were uh, transitioning back to the office, but I start off. You know, I think some of the stuff we're starting to notice in our organization and other organizations that surround us about company officer decisions. And I know you have a lot of thoughts about that. Then I'll go, you know, so I'll let you lay the foundation of what we're experiencing. And then I'll let the, uh, everybody chime in about uh, either what you said or what they're experiencing in their area. So, you know, it was just basically, you know, what about the company officer decision process is really starting to stumble with us right now. Yeah, absolutely. Rick. Welcome everybody. And, uh, Chief Halton, thanks again for the opportunity. And, uh, you know, obviously we're still keeping you in our thoughts and prayers. Glad to see you're doing well and you're kicking cancer's butt. So, um, so, you know, a couple, uh, Rick, I just kind of jotted down a couple mm -hmm. topics that I, I, I think I'll, I'll speak my topics out and then we'll, we'll go down the line and see, uh, see if everybody, what they want to pick up on and talk about. Um, so, um, you know, first, anytime you talk about new company officer decision making, right, the OODA loop comes up. So if anybody wants to chime in on the OODA loop and uh, how we can bring that towards the fire service and where that falls in line with company officer decision making. Um, along with that, um, you know, the, the biggest expectation that I have of, with a company officer that I think that you can do as a company officer is, is communicate. And I think communication is key in, in every aspect. Um, whether it be your expectations, whether, whether it be the overall mission, yours as a company or as the department's mission as a whole, right? Because if we don't know what the mission is, we can't necessarily move forward with, uh, with what we're going to do on, on the fire ground in the firehouse and, and so forth. Um, you know, as a company officer, another one I have written down is set the tone. Um, so you set the tone, what you do and uh, how you lead is, is what's going to be followed. Um, another one that I had written down, and this is a big one for me, is control what you can control. Sometimes, obviously, uh, you know, different agencies and different departments are at different times, whether it be budget restraints or morale in general. And that's part of your job as a, as a company officer is being able to, to rally the folks and uh, control what you can control within the firehouse and remind them of that. Um, and I can go over some topics with that. Um, and, and being handcuffed as a company officer and how to overcome that or, you know, what has handcuffed you up to this point and, and how to how to achieve over that. So um, 
those are the topics that I'd like to like to cover. Rick, does anybody want to chime in on that or? Yeah, Donnie, with all those, I think we also need to, to worry about, you know, I think with the departments as they become more reliant on standard operating procedures or general orders or whatever you want to say, you know, I, I always heard the concern from the company officer saying, oh, you're taking the decision making process away from me. You know, and I don't think, I think we hump, we add on more decisions every day onto the company officer rather than taking them away. Uh, just the sheer amount of stuff that they have to do. So before we get to Donnie's, I want to go, I'm going to go to Roger and then I'll go to, uh, to Sam and Mike is that, so I mean, Roger, you're, you're an acting company officer at, you know, in Baltimore city and, you know, engine eight is a engine eight and truck 10 is a well uh, glorified on the internet, uh, you know, through your guys, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook and the incredible videos that uh, you guys put out. But I meant, so I meant, you know, a box drops, in, in Baltimore and engine eight is going to run first too. I mean, I mean, what is the sheer amount of decisions that and things that you have to do as a company officer, you know, almost all the way up to when we're almost knocking the fire down. I mean, I mean, that's a long list of things. Uh, like, uh, I don't want to what Donnie said and it starts well before the box drops, the expectation level has to be set well before and the skill sets already in place. Um, uh, not using the, the general orders as a crutch or anything, but understanding them and or the construction that we're going to and depending on which way we turn out of the firehouse, how far we're going. Our first due is fairly the same, but if we're going out into the second, third, or fifth due, the construction can change. So the process going through there, everybody, we're communicating the entire time going down the street. It's not just a, a quiet ride with the uh, cue peg and the air horn going. A lot of uh, which side of the street, look, listening for updates, and just if somebody's maybe has familiarity with that address or that block, uh, the last day of the vacants that we have, oftentimes we run them day in day out. So maybe I took a run the other week and was like, "Hey, that 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 side of the street doesn't have any floors." So we're communicating that so the bike can understand when he gets out. Like, okay, I if the door is wide open, I still need to pump the brakes. Being cognizant of that, if you have a, a younger guy that the officer is, needs to be doing all of his initial reports and his 360s and checking conditions, but at the same time, making sure sometimes you got to put the reins on that younger guy is just looking to charge in. Uh, so it's just the experience when the tenure comes uh, you can see some younger officers that are overwhelmed on the uh, as fast as we get to incidents. Um, our average response time is probably 30 to 60 seconds for our first two. Uh, that's a lot to process in that time as a younger person without much experience. Uh, so relying heavily on the other crew members, uh, experienced pump operators or emergency vehicle drivers, they want to in on the engine or the truck. And just, if it's a younger author, just asking, just turn around and just throw a question out there. Don't be afraid to ask the, your driver or if you have a senior guy in the back, hey, you know anything about this or whatever. Well, I mean, you know, you know, you have these, you get, you get a 60 second response time in Baltimore because, I mean, you guys burned half the city down at one point in your career. So, you know, they had to put a bunch of firehouses in there. So, <laughs> to, to not to burn the city down again. So, I wish they were all still open. <laughs> yeah, true. True. I wish I, I, I wish I owned one of them. So, <laughs> we have about half as many as at one point. Yeah. So, I mean, Sammy, I'll kind of, you know, Mr. Humble, you know, oh, I'm not a good company officer. I don't know anything about being a company officer you know, been a lieutenant at busy places. Now he's a captain of a rescue, you know. So give us your humble opinion, Sam, you know, all these decisions that you have to make as a company officer. I mean, other than yelling at people and, you know. Should have never sent you that video. <laughs> um, no, I, I honestly, uh, the way I look at it is I don't want to talk to you on the fire ground. Um, I, I have I have very little desire to talk to you on the fire ground. So if I do say something, um, you're not going to suffer from parent deafness. Uh, it, it's actually meaningful uh, and important. 
I really think of my job as making sure that they're making the right decisions they need to. And that comes from just drilling and, and not drilling to the point where they can um, replicate or regurgitate the right things, but they actually understand them so that they are processing their own information and applying the right um, tactic to the function that we've been called to mitigate. So I mean, well, so I mean, obviously Scott, Scott's in a new position. You know, we talk about Scott as a, a battalion chief now in Wichita, a member of the fire engineering uh, group, uh, does a lot of stuff at FDIC. So I mean, what what do you think? You know, as, as Scott's moved up there, I know you guys are pretty close. I mean, that's a that's a different aspect. I mean, now he's relying on all these company officers that he used to go into fire buildings with, and you know, you guys probably kept a lot of stuff secret. If I know the Scott and Sam Hiddle uh, code. Um, you know, so now all that stuff like Donnie's talking about communication. I mean, I'm sure now Scott's trying to extract that now from the company officers that he rode with on every day in the street. So, yeah, and I think it, it's changed from him listening to uh, him operate on um, fire grounds right now. You know, I'm still in a position where I can work very intimately with um, with the crews and and can figure out um, whether or not they're understanding something or whether or not they are truly uh, grasping the concept and not just relying on a statement that I've made. And this kind of goes back to what Chief Halton started the whole show with, um, that interpersonal communication. Um, you just can't um, beat being face-to-face -face and looking at someone. 80% of our communication is uh, nonverbal, right? You can say, okay, you're nodding your head, but you're not truly understanding why you're building this system out this way, or you're not understanding why you need to flow that line for 10 seconds. Um, Whereas Scott, you know, he's, he obviously can't go work with those company officers as much. So he's in a position where he has to clearly communicate. This is what I expect you to do. Um, if I tell you that I want you to take a backup line, um, I want you to take the backup line to the second floor. But he's also in charge of the overall strategy of the fire ground now. Um, we have the luxury of just making sure that we execute our specific function. So, Mike, you got you've had three people talk now. And I'm sure you've written down all the stuff that, that you wanted to comment on. So, we'll let we'll let you go. Thanks very much. Uh, once again, appreciate the opportunity uh, to jump in with this great group and uh, and learn and share. Um, I'll go back to the OODA loop comment, which to me is kind of critical. It gets into do we have a system or do we have something that we can use to help us make decisions. Um, as an instructor, as a training officer, uh, and to Sam's comment, I've got to make sure that people can truly make a decision and they're not simply using habits, they're not simply following autopilot, or they're not just a parrot or a monkey that's doing what they saw uh, someone else do. So I think it's very critical that when we develop our company officers that we, they or we come up with a system where they can get consistent results and we know they're capable of doing that. Um, if not, they're gonna be great at fighting that one room and contents fire in a legacy building, but now you switch it up and you've got an actual structure fire in a type five lightweight and they're doing the same thing and they're not succeeding. So I think that's key is we have to give them the tools uh, in the toolbox to, to make good decisions and being around as long as I have and moving around the country um, there's not, in my opinion, a lot of great programs that train just decision making. Um, and I think that's critical and we need to work on that and make sure that that is as they move into that position, they're able to, to develop that. Um, we talk about education, training, experience and self-development. Uh, in my humble opinion, it takes all four to be successful. Um, so do we have good programs that are that are helping to develop our company officers or are they just great at dragging hose and throwing ladders? but lack what it takes to make the good, good, hard decisions. So. Yeah. I, uh, could I step in for a second, Ricky? Oh, am I on? Ricky's muted. Go ahead. Oh, Sam. Okay. Um, no, I, I just want to piggyback on what, um, what Mike just said. Um, he's absolutely right. We can get guys really good at one room fires, particularly if we give them the same host stretch over and over and over and, and then what we build is um, habits. And when they go into that condition black or that uh, stressful situation, they're just gonna regurgitate um, physically what they've known. Uh, one of the things that 
uh, I like to do when we do company level training is nobody gets the same drill. Um, for instance, we were doing gantries the other day and each time that gantry had to be set up with different parameters, different lanes, different leg spread. Uh, nobody gets the same drill. So they're not able to just repeat what they watched uh, two minutes ago, but they actually have to process the information. I I'm sorry. Is gantry a rescue squad thing? Uh, as far as you know. Okay. All right. I just <laughs> go ahead, Chief Bobby. So a, a lot of stuff to unpack. Uh, you know, Donnie started us off talking about Boyd and the, and the you know, the observe, decide, the, the Boyd loop, you know, and, and everybody knows the Boyd story, at least in this group. If you don't, fighter pilot, you know, walked into a Marine Corps base one day because the Air Force wouldn't listen to him and talked about his decision making process and became history. So, and, and basically what he captured was what Gary Klein later uh, describes in his books, Intuition at Work, Sources of Power, Three Lights and Shadows, uh, several others, as naturalistic decision making, right? And the key to remember is that decisions are always made in context. And so familiarity reduces stress. And, you, and we know from Damasio's work and others, Ensley, Woods, uh, you know, that the less stress involved, the more decisions you can make. But if you put high stress, then you can make about four critical decisions. And critical decisions are different than, you know, uh, task-oriented routine things like, you know, setting the parking brake or, you know, putting the outriggers down, things that you can develop during drill, right? But decision-making, decision-making implies that there's an option or that there's knowns and unknowns and someone has to actually apply you know, cognitive resource to doing that. And on every fire, obviously there is, right? Because we don't know everything. And I think from my opinion on it, there's work as imagined versus work as done. And when we're doing simulation and drill, we know the ending, there isn't that stress level. So it's a little bit different. It can still help build models. But I think when we look at people who make decisions in context, one of the things to remember is that we know the ending. So we know a lot more than they knew when they were making those decisions. I also think, and I'll throw this out there, is that I don't believe that it's necessary. And let's take Rogers. He's 30, 30 to 60 seconds out from the, the, the incident. And behind him, I'll, I'll guarantee in at least another 30, maybe 40 seconds is a battalion chief. But yet we'll make that first piece of apparatus say that they're assuming command. And it's, I was part of the problem. I helped Chief Bernicini write Fire Ground Command years ago. And I'll say right now, and I've been saying it for the last five years, I don't think that the first do in, in many urban, you know, well-developed systems has any need to assume command of the fire. They need to size up what they're seeing and what they're going to do and go to work. And then nine, in most of those systems, the battalion chief is right there or they're a minute out or because the problem with putting... We force, our systems currently force all that decision-making down on the person who's least equipped to make those decisions because he's, he's trying to size the thing up. He's trying to figure out what, or she, and she's trying to figure out what to do with her crew. She's trying to figure out in or out. I mean, and, and now you want to give directions to, you know, ladder 10, that's two minutes out. It can be a completely different fire in two minutes. So I think that that's a fundamental issue to talk about when we're talking about decision-making. First and foremost, Context drives decision making. Period. You know, you, you get you know, you get a structure that's just completely engulfed at two o'clock in the afternoon with no hope of you know, I mean, fire out of every window. That's a pretty easy fire for anybody on this call. You go two o'clock in the morning to a residential that's got fire on the first floor, looks like it's extending, and no family in the yard. That's a different fire. You know, so, and, and then go to a multifamily, different fire, go to a, uh, you know, a, 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 a larger commercial, different fire. So context drives the decision-making. And I, I think that more fingers on the knife. I'm a big, I'm a big, you know, the, the more collaborators you can get, the better. I, I think the whole idea of the Lone Ranger out there was a bad idea. And it was mine, it was part of mine. So I could say it was a bad idea. <laughs> So, hey. I mean, I'm, 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 oh. I'm scared, ahead, Donnie. I was going to kind of lead you into something, Donnie. So. Yeah, no, I just wanted to comment on Bobby and Sam saying I, I totally agree with both of what you're saying. 
Um, and to, uh, you know, it's, it's a topic I was going to bring up on, on um, what Sam was talking about, but with, with Bobby's last comment, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, one thing you want to keep as an officer and one thing that you can't do when you're arriving on scene as a new company officer and trying to establish command, but take care of your crews, you can't detach, right? So any leadership book you read talks about detachment, detachment, you got to detach yourself as an officer, detach yourself as a leader um, and keep a big picture of, of what your crew's doing. So, and, and, and for me personally, that was one of the biggest challenges with each promotion was finding out how to detach myself from my last role. So when I made Lieutenant, Um, you know, I'm now working with a crew. I'm now in charge of a crew and we arrive on scene of a house fire. And the first thing I'm doing is hopping off after I get my return and I'm going to the back step to pull a line and I see a guy there doing that job. So I go, okay, not, it's not my job anymore. You know, uh, I get to the front door and I go to pop it and there's a guy there getting ready, you know, with a halligan bar, getting ready to pop the door. So it took me, um, a little bit of time to learn how to detach myself and, and command the crew versus getting so you know, focus oriented on, on what we're doing. And I can't see the big picture as they're popping the door. I'm taking a step back and, and looking at what the, where the fire is, where it's progressing, looking at the cars in the driveway and taking all that in things that I never thought previously as, you know, as a, as a lineman or a backstep firefighter, Um, you know, and, and with that, I'm not, I don't want to go too much down a rabbit hole here. Um, But, you know, hats off to, you know, when we talk about those, those stressful scenarios, hats off to Scott Kraut and the crew from, um, the, the drilling at the speed of flashover class, because that's exactly what, what they're doing at FDIC is trying to get you to your, to your red and your black, right? So we're starting with the, with the crawl, walk, then run at, in their class where they're teaching you techniques and anything you read will say, you have to do something 25 times before you start developing muscle memory for that. So they'll run you through certain scenarios, teach you the techniques, uh, you know, 25 to 30 times, and then they'll start putting you in a stressful environment to build up on it. And uh, as being an instructor with that class, it's funny how you can teach somebody something to Sam's credit um, that they didn't know 20 minutes before, you know, I'm not going to say 20 minutes, but an hour before. And we, we build those repetitions, we build those repetitions, and then we put them in this stressful environment where they start getting auditory exclusion, where they start getting tunnel vision. Um, and, you know, their body is shunting and they're starting to move to their forebrain for their thinking. And we put them in these environments. And the first thing they're doing is reverting back to the thing we just ran them through 30 times, uh, you know, a half an hour before that they weren't even aware of it. Their body's telling them to, to go through these motions, which is great. Um, and, you know, one thing as a company officer, or as a battalion chief that that teaches you is, you know, when all this fails, we're going to revert back on our training. And when all this fails, you know, we want, we need to keep things stupid. We need to keep things simple. Um, you know, w- when we do get into that stressful environment, it, you know, it's not going to be something complex that's going to lead us out of it. It's going to be simple tasks, simple oriented tasks that are that are going to help us uh, hop out of that and and get back to uh, get back to somewhat normalcy. So, uh, go ahead, Rick. Sorry to sorry to sorry, go down a rabbit hole. That's right, because I mean, it's kind of leads me into this this point is that when we talk about these company officers, is that you know what what have we actually trained them on? I mean, you know, it's. We, we go to this fight, you know, we go back to Bobby's comedy. You know, it's two o'clock in the morning. We show up at a residential house now. Hey, it's on fire. Well, what type of fire is it? You know, is it a basement fire? Is it an outside in fire? Is it a room and contents? You know, is there survivable space? And then they have to make their decisions off of that. Now, obviously, the education has been put out, you know, by Steve Kerber and that group, you know, agree on some of it, disagree on a lot of it. Um, but it wants to be it's education. And then now we're, you know, these these company officers could go take this education, whether it be from fire engineering, from Steve Kerber, you know, the the fire service instructors, you know, through all their grants that they've gotten, um, and and start acting like that, acting, having those actions on the fire ground. But is is it truly what the department is doing? You know, it, does everybody in the fire in the fire in the fire on the box alarm or in the department know that hey, yeah, we're going to attack an outside in fire from the Charlie side or? wherever the fire started on the outside rather than go right inside the front door. And is that all in your plan? And, you know, and I, I forget, maybe Bobby remembers it. Uh, you know, Bill Carey has a saying that I'm starting to really like, you know, you know, do you, you know, uh, you know, so a, a fire department that has two or three purple on a fire truck can't do New York city. You know, they can't do Chicago. They can't do Wichita. You know, they can only do themselves. And that plan has to be there 
to attack all these different fires that were going with. So once again, you know, we're heaping all this responsibility on that company officer to understand all these different type fires, how they're going to deploy, how we're going to search. And then once again, it goes back to Bobby's thing. I am 1000% behind Bobby on take this command stuff away from the company officer, you know, let him make tactical decisions and, you know, communicate those on the radio and the battalion chief or the chief that's responding in, you know, he, he processes that information and then applies it through all his senses. Once he gets there, is it, all right, he said he's here. This is the type fire he said he had. This is where he's deployed. You know, it's two o'clock in the morning. I don't see anybody outside. You know, what else do I have to do? Once again, a myriad of, of, of decision-making has to be made, but, you know, if this company officer makes a series of bad decisions, when the when the, the chief gets there, it's going to take him five to ten minutes to correct any of those uh, uh, failed decisions. You know, I'm not saying bad decisions, but you know, he just made a failed decision. He's got to correct all those, then he's going to get caught up with the fire uh, and, where that's at. So, and to be clear, you know, Don, absolutely, I mean, none of us are saying that we don't want the first two guy or gal. To, to 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 size it up to give us let us know what we're what we're walking into right we expect them to say hey i'm looking at a three story walk up i got fire on these wood rear porches whatever i've got right but the 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 construct from the dip back in the day was then they assume command and start supervising these other people and and i i just think it's a construct that's just not really relevant to most robust systems now in some systems absolutely critical. They don't have, you know, command could be five, 10, 15 minutes out, you know, different story, right? Or, or that company officer might be a captain. And in that system, they're expected to function as, you know, like a battalion chief or chief officer. But for most organizations that I've been to, even, you know, the smaller volunteers that I spend a lot of time with, that's just not the case. You know what I mean? It's just not the case. So yeah, I absolutely. And you I, I agree wholeheartedly with you, Chief. It's, it's, you know, you see these, the institution of this tactical command floating around and I, I, I'm, I'm right there with you, you know, if obviously if it's something to deviate from the normalcy of, you know, a small task of, hey, first doing, hey, we're on the scene, uh, side alpha, we got a two story fire showing. Uh, and then as he gets in there, he does his 360 and sees bodies hanging out the rear windows. Obviously he wants to be able to have that. He wants to be able to have that, um, you know, that autonomy to be able to say, Hey, first do ladder. You're not covering the front. I need you to go to the rear and, and get the bodies off the, you know, get the bodies off the balconies, et cetera. Um, but, you know, with that, they're also starting to throw in all the other command tasks that should be going to the battalion chief of, Hey, this unit cleared for a call. Uh, do you want them added? Or, you know, do you want to start investigations? Like that, that's something that they don't need to be bothered with at that point. Um, just purely immediate immediate operational side. Like, so like I said, I'm, 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 I'm in whole agreement with you. Can you imagine, can you just fathom uh, the dispatcher trying to tell Sammy Hiddle this, you know, riding on a call <laughs> chief captain Hiddle, we're starting you the fire investigators. I can only imagine what that radio transmission would be. I've seen how angry he gets when somebody brings out the wrong type of cheese to him. And I can only imagine <laughs> if you do something operational, what he's going to do. <laughs> I have videos, but I'm not allowed to show them. So, um, <laughs> Mike, I, 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 you got a lot of nodding going over there. Do you want to chime in on some of this? Just one thing I would throw out, um, which got mentioned, was um, we talk about it in terms of resiliency and redundancy. If you make a decision, do you have any resiliency built in or redundancy? So if that doesn't work, what's plan B, what's plan C? Um, and that's the other thing, because – as the military well knows, any plan rarely survives the first minute of contact. So in the real world, when you go in with the plan and it doesn't go as you expected, what's plan B, what's C? And can we recover from that as you were just talking about? And I think that's another thing in decision-making uh, that we wanna make sure we're getting into because if not, we put all of our eggs in one basket, it doesn't work and now what do we do? So I think that goes back into something we need to build into our training programs uh, when we're trying to prepare company officers to make decisions. So. Hey, and just a, a quick point to that is the only way you're going to be able to see as a company officer that plan A, plan B, plan C is not working and it's time to switch it up as if you are removed, right? If you're so focused on watching the barman and he's, he's, you know, what he's doing to this door is not working. 
but you're so focused. Slide this here, slide this, that there. You have to be able to be detached somewhat to realize, hey, we're on our third plan. We're 40 seconds into it now. Plan B, let's get around the side door or whatever have you. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Chief Bobby? And the, and the one other thing to dovetail off of Mike and Donnie is that sometimes pattern recognition works against us, right? So you might not see that something's unraveling because you're seeing aspects of a pattern that work for you. A great study that was done by Dr. Woods uh, with pilots was that they gave them simulations and military pilots. And what they had them do was they gave them weather differences. They gave them this difference. They gave them load differences. They gave them a bunch of different variables that pilots would get used to. And they had them going into this airport that they got them familiar with. And then in the middle of the simulations, they put a, a, a Southwest Airlines 737 in the middle of the runway, right? Just parked it right there in the runway that they're landing on. And I'm not exactly sure on the number, but I think it's like 85% of the pilots never saw the Southwest Airlines because the pattern had become so ingrained, they were dealing with these other critical variables and, and they call it inattentive blindness. It's the invisible gorilla thing. You're counting the passes. You don't see the lady in the gorilla suit pound her chest. That's a real thing. You know, it's, it's like when we go to car accidents all the time and the people say, I didn't see the motorcycle. They flat out, they may have, they, they may have taken it in through their ocular nerve, but their reticulator didn't, tra they, they didn't cognitively process that motorcycle in front of them. And, and, and it wasn't that they weren't paying attention. It wasn't that they're a bad driver. It wasn't because they were my age. You know, they, they flat out, it didn't, it didn't get processed in their brain in large part because our patterns can overwhelm us. You know, our patterns can, our patterns can dominate. And we've all seen it with our friends in bars. You know, they have a pattern that they use over and over and over again. It never works for them. So I'm just kidding. But you know what I mean? I think, and I think when we take it to the, to the, uh, the realm of decision-making, we have to understand that I think we need to do simulations, we need to do training, we need to get people ready, but then we need to do, build systems that support decision-making. And if you, if you put one person in there, expect them to make 30, 40 decisions, that's not, that's not gonna work. It's just, no, I don't care if you're Stephen Bloody Hawkins, you could be, you could be Leo Stapleton, Dick Sylvia, Alan Brunacini, Tom Brennan, Vinnie Dunn, you know, your hero's name here, you know, by themselves in front of a fire and they can get over, they'll get overwhelmed pretty quickly, you know, but it, you could put us five knuckleheads together. And, and, if, and if we're together and we can talk, we'll, we'll kick its butt. Oh, just to, just so we know, uh, D uh, Bill Carey sent us a chat and told me to say, you can't fight a Mount pilot fire with Mayberry staffing and resources. And I think probably Mike and Bobby and I understand what that means. I'm just not sure that Sam, Donnie, and Roger do. So, No, I always say you can't put a porcupine in a barn and expect them to make licorice. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing, right? <laughs> well, uh, that's well, Andy, good, Sam. Aunt B would be proud. Aunt B would be proud of that there saying there, Andy. Uh, yeah. Sammy's going to oh. start talking about photosynthesis if we let him keep going here shortly. <laughs> hey, that's a dangerous place that Sammy hit on mind. Yeah. Roger, do you have a, a, anything you want to add on all this? And we want to come back to you. So, uh, I, I think where it gets interesting, guys, is, is you know, I think we need to. It was a, a good buddy of mine told me a long time ago it's hard to outperform your system, right? So, the, the, the key has to be to put people into systems that support decision making. And then I really believe that, you know, we've almost infantized the firefighter, the worker, you know what I mean? And in some organizations to where, you know, they're so scripted and they're so rigid that they think that the, 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 the membership isn't talented. There's a great example uh, just from traffic safety of an engineer, I believe it was in Sweden, might've been Denmark, that they asked him, they had a really bad road where lots of accidents happen and they asked him to fix it. The guy took out all the signs, all the striping, took out everything, and accidents disappeared because people started taking responsibility for what they were doing on their own. They weren't trusted. They weren't looking. You know, they weren't expecting people to stay in the lane. There were no lanes. You know, you had to deal with what you had to deal with. So I think if we trust our people more and give them better systems to work in and guardrails, right? Like 
We want the first two to let us know what's going on and what they're doing. It'll happen, you know. Safety third. Safety yep. third. And I know Sammy's going to perk up on this, right? But all these things, you know, can be found in that uh, the Grossman's book on combat, right? So we talk about training in the right things so that we do revert back to them and creating that muscle memory. Um, and I think it was you were talking about that the uh, the airline pilots that are you know they're so tunnel vision they're so task oriented focused that they're that they're uh, that they don't even see the big airliner jet within their within their picture picture right so that that book brings up great topics of uh, police involved shootings and it talks about um, you know you know they you know they're questioning these officers about their shooting and they're like I was the only one that shot and I shot one time and that was it you know, and, and once they remove themselves from the scene that, you know, the investigators like, well, actually three other people shot and you each shot 14 times, you know, whatever, you know, whatever number it was, because you get so focused on what's in front of you that you do get all that, uh, that exclusion now. So they say, point. The most, they say the most unreliable witness in court is an eyewitness. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree <with> that. <laughs> Sammy. But I guess then the challenge is for us when we talk about all this stuff. I think Boyd is a great place to start. I think I think to to Mike's point, you know, you got to train. You, you got to have some. You got to reduce as much stress as you can. And I think a lot of that, obviously, I think Scott's class, you know, drilling at the speed of flashover is amazing. Writ under fire from the uh, Illinois Fire Services Institute is just amazing. There are a lot of courses where the you get that stress inoculation, but in in many of those courses you know, the, the missing kind of element there is the, 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 the person making the decision. And the company officer, why I like those classes is the company officer is generally with skin in the game right next to the firefighter making those in context decisions. And then we've got that next layer of decision making, which is the poor person that has to stay outside the fire and, and who really is orchestrating, you know, and that's a whole nother realm of decision making that I think is the the next level. And I don't think, I don't know how you separate them out, right? Because I, I, I'm a big fan of Malone's small unit leadership. I agree with you completely, Donnie. You, you got to be, you're, if you're on the team, you're on the team and you can't detach. You know what I mean? Uh, so that, that it's, it's a wickedly complex problem. But for company officer, what we're focused on today, it's nice to hear everybody thinking, you know, in a, in a similar vein. But if you think about our systems across the country, not many of our systems are accommodating what we're talking about today. No, we rely on the experience to, uh, to backfill, to make that happen for us. The experience of the members that we're uh, in command of at that moment. Yeah. And we're actually doing on the contrary. Like you said, we're reducing that and bringing it back to one. So. Mike, did you have something? I'm, I'm sorry, I thought I saw you. Yeah, I would. He had, he had his mic on, then he shut it off. <laughs> so. A couple of things that Bobby threw out. Um, bias. Uh, bias, if you get a chance, study cognitive biases, because that will greatly affect your decision making. Um, once again, we don't realize how that's coming into play, but that can set us up for failure. And then um, got to give Rich Gasway credit. Um, something here very important, which is human error leads to flawed situational awareness, leads to poor decision making. Um, and I think we're all humans. We're all going to make mistakes, no matter how much training, whatever. So that goes back to do we have resiliency or redundancy when that happens? Um, we've all talked about are we being situationally aware? Are we in the context? Are we picking up what we need? And then are we actually making decisions? Um, there's uh, another great book, The Power of Habit, because what we'll find out as firefighters, way too many times we think we're making a decision, we're not. We're falling back to a habit or a pattern that we have. And if we do it because it works, and that can go into like normalization of deviance, where I've done something nine times and it works, but the 10th time, one of those factors is gonna change. And if I can't recognize that, then it's not going to work. Um, and those are the key things that we have to incorporate into our training. Oh. So the one thing I think we need to be careful about is 
A, situational awareness, and B, root causes. And, and I love Rich. He's a good friend of mine. But here's the problem is that if you lose situational awareness, what replaces it? Sawdust? I mean, Chaos. <laughs> well, it's another term for the fact that they, people were unaware of something, but why they're unaware of it is more important. In other words, when we say someone lost situational awareness, we're just putting a label on something without really understanding what was occupying their working memory. In other words, why did they make the decisions they made? And the other problem I have with root causes is root causes is just where you stop looking, right? And, and it's always been that thing where they say human error. It was human error. Well, yeah, no shit. Humans were involved. I mean, and, and, and it's only an error in hindsight. But to those people, especially those people with skin in the game, it made sense to them at the time. And the, and the question is why? So, you know, I'm, I'm not a root causes guy because that, that makes us believe that the world is a linear construct, right? A leads to B leads to C. And we all know on the fire ground, it, nothing could be further from the truth. So I think that you can come up with a, a set of factors that influenced, you know, a situation, but in, in a dynamically complex environment, and that's what a fire is, you can eliminate any one of those factors and you can still have the same exact outcome, or you can interject multiple factors. Not, none of them are exclusive and none of them are so, you know, none, none of them are, are, are completely necessary. So, you, you know, you, you, it, the absence of evidence isn't the evidence of absence. And so when you start talking about, just for me, and I love Richie, he's a great friend, but when you start talking about root causes, my antenna goes up because again, you're, you're, you go back to that chain of events thing. That's not true. There's no, there's no, that, that, that's just, that's oversimplification of how the world works. It's a dynamic fire environment, as Sam can explain to us at ad infinitum, is a dynamically complex environment. And the nuances of it are so 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 amazingly complex that there's literally billions of factors that influence every single fire. So, you know, I, I just think that we can look at and we can we can look at influencing factors. I think we can look at things that played a role. But I, I'm, I'm loath to use terms like complacency. I'm loath to use terms like they lost situational awareness. And, and I don't know how you really increase that, right? Because what's occupying my working memory is what's occupying my working memory for whatever reason. So I don't know, other than when, when we talk about increasing people's bandwidth by having collaboration, and, and that all has to do with co cognition. So, and I hate to go all wonky on you there, but uh, I'm... I'm and I love Rich. I don't mean to throw Richie under the bus, but that's a broad conversation. And and because um, people think, oh, you can teach situational awareness, so you can't. You know, what I mean, it's not a, it's a construct. It's not a, it's not a tangible element. You know, you can you can improve people's experience. You can give them more experience, but you can't teach situational awareness. And 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 you can provide an environment where people can be under less stress and and maybe have more bandwidth. But it's a it's that's a real wonky, uh, and, and I love Richie, but I, I struggle with those two constructs. Well, Chief, so, I mean, with, with that topic, I mean, so would you agree that you can't teach situational awareness, but you could teach situational reaction? I think you can teach people how to assess uh, more factors. I think you can, and you can broaden people's experience base. You can introduce new factors, but the problem is, is that we know from incredible amount of research that under pressure, people can deal with about four variables, four, four critical. <clears throat> After that, you're done. doesn't matter. Right. You can be Albert bloody Einstein, limited information, conflicting goals, high stakes, or unless you have support and assistance. And, and that, that, that's really the, if you're a company officer, that's your world, man. You, you, you know, you in or out, you know, you know, who's on the line with me, who's not on the line with me. You know where do we spot the apparatus, and and you know how yeah. long can we hold our breath if things go horribly wrong. So it's a it, so it's tough. I think that I think you can you can improve, improve people's ability to assess things, but I don't know the construct situational awareness came from the air, air the uh, it came from calling the ball and fighter pilots. They came up with that term, and, and and it's a great term. It's a great construct, but I think we have to be careful about using it as a, ex, ex, it's not an explanation for anything. So, it's I mean, when we, 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 we kind of talk about this and we, you know, 
a way to help out. So we talk about the situational awareness that, you know, Chief Halton was talking about. And then how do, if it fails, what do we do? Well, I mean, part of it is, you know, I get to, I get to watch a lot of battalions in the position I have. And then as I come in as a support role, you know, I, I have a car, I, I'll run every call that comes out, every box alarm that comes out. So when I go to a call and it's a food on the stove or a sparking outlet or, you know, something, you know, it's been handled by that first company officer or maybe one or two companies and I get there and, you know, it's been in service for five minutes and I still see the first arriving engine, the truck, maybe the second arriving engine and the chief there. And they're having a conversation about a sparking outlet. Um, is it, hey, do we position the apparatus correctly? Do we stress the right line? Where do we throw the ground ladders? You know, is, is creating that situational awareness and creating that, that bank of, hey, this is what we need to do for this multifamily dwelling. This is what we need to do for this single family dwelling. So having those constant conversations with your company officers about their decision-making process at a sparking outlet and food on the stove, room and contents. So when we show up to the, you know, a floor off with, you know, like Donnie said, people hanging out the, you know, the rear windows, you know, we've, we've kind of constructed, you know, this decision-making process or, you know, the situational awareness on these little fires or, or little incidents each and every time we go out. Now, when you show up and all the companies are gone and the chief's gone and nobody's having conversations, there's a pretty good chance we're going to have a problem sooner or later down the line. So, Sammy, you look like you're ready to jump through the screen. So, no, I, I just I, I love what you're saying because what you're doing is taking um, minimal experience and trying to uh, maximize implicit behaviors. Okay, when, once I go look up what implicit behaviors is, then I'll be uh... so real quick. We have a question from um, Greg at Redmond, and, and Greg was is not losing situation awareness, becoming less aware. So, situation awareness was a construct that was developed, and I can't think of the man's name. But if you want to read about it uh, in more depth, uh, Sydney Decker has written about it in, in great depth. Sydney has written um, a, a dozen books or so. But situation awareness is just a construct that refers to what people, what inputs people were weighing at the time of their decision making process and what inputs they weren't weighing. In other words, uh, the classic is the airline pilots that were very upset about a, a warning light uh, that, that wasn't reacting and they flew a plane into the side of a mountain. And people said they lost situational awareness. Yeah, because they were obsessed over this warning light that was occupying that was occupying all of their attention. So it's kind of a term that people came up for what your focus is, what your attention's on. So I think Dr. David Woods is gonna is a good place to read. He wrote Behind Human Error. Uh, you got Antonio Damasio, who's got several books out there. He's a cognitive neuroscientist who's written some great books on it. You've got Sidney Decker, who we mentioned earlier. You've got Ensley, who just uh, came out with a great book. And then there's a guy named Holnagel, and Holnagel, Eric Holnagel, he's got some wonderful writing on, on all of that. So, you know, I think we can improve people's ability to recognize cues, cue recognition. And I think, you know, Alan Bernstein used to call them critical fireground factors. But the, the broad construct of situational awareness basically refers to what inputs people were aware of and were weighing at the time versus in hindsight, what they weren't, right? And they call it hindsight bias. And part of the problem becomes, to, to Mike's point earlier, confirmation bias is when we put more weight on the things that we're uh, sure of and that we know of or that we expect than the things that we don't expect or don't want or aren't aware of. And so um, to, to your question, Greg, that's a great question. So it's a, it's a lot of words too. It's almost like, you know, Foucault and Derrida would, you know, neuro, just language all over the place. And I don't mean to go there. I'm not trying to obfuscate, but I think to, to, to most simply put, it's a construct and that construct refers to inputs. And it, it's difficult, according to the neuroscientist, Dr. Woods in particular, and Dr. Damasio, under stress and pressure, really, really, really big time stress and pressure, it's very difficult to deal with more than four critical decisions for critical inputs. So, it, and, 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 and they're, they're, they're very well, very well written people. So if you Google those guys, you can get just a ton of, Sydney's written a ton of books. Uh, Dr. Woods has written a ton um, and, and they're all really great things to look at. And thank you for the question. All right, Mike, we're getting down these last couple minutes here. You got anything you wanna add on here at the end? 
Uh, the only thing that I would throw in to kind of follow up on some of that is, is going back to um, that, you know, once again, to make a decision, as Bobby's pointing out, we have to take things in, evaluate them, considerate them, and then come up with an outcome. Um, and once again, what I think we fall into too many times is uh, we refer to it as autopilot, where you'll get an inch and three quarter to the front door for an interior attack, and that just becomes the routine or the habit. Um, and if we don't have effective training, as Sam brought up, where we're constantly changing things up or throwing things at them, um, then we fall into these routines, ruts, or patterns. And once again, they'll work for a while or they'll work in certain circumstances, but um, they don't necessarily lead to success. And then if they're not, do we have something to catch that that we can fall back on? Um, but thanks very much. Appreciate it. Sammy? Um, I would just uh, say this um, for closing. Uh, it got up, uh, got brought up uh, subtly um, when we're talking about company officer decision making. Um, when it goes back to what we teach them is what they're going to default back to. It's very important that we pick things and we're training them on things that are going to be reliable for most situations. Um, we can't do it for every situation, obviously, and that's where we do speak up and we start being more um, more direct with our communication in the fire ground. Um, so with that said, I would encourage um, everybody along with the other 20 things that they have to research after listening to this show, um, look at the uh, Stanford studies on uh, learning and relearning. Um, it, it's it's more, um, more difficult than we realize to relearn a behavior. Okay, and Roger? Thanks for having me. Uh, sorry, I didn't talk too much. Uh, but uh, would it just end up being echoing what everybody else is saying a lot more eloquently than I could have? But, uh, just rely on the experience, and, like try to get the experiences and uh, learn from them. If you're the junior guy and there's a senior officer or a senior fireman, sit there and talk to them. That's, uh, I had a great experience when uh, my early days when I was able to to get the acting spot in Baltimore, I went to work for a, a lieutenant with 38 years on. So I knew at some point he was going to retire. So I just go sit in the office and ask him small questions about just little things every time trying to chip away from that block to get that experience, some of those experiences in my head. I mean, he remodeled West Baltimore for the most part. So if all of us on the crew can go ahead and take parts of that and then that's going to go towards your decision making once hey what do you have what would you do on this or what would you do on that and not just leave it as oh i take the inch and three quarter to the front door but okay why like start asking the whys and like sam said on the fire ground is not the time to ask the why but afterwards hey lou hey, hey cap chief whatever make sure we're not just checking the boxes like yeah i, I went to the roof and i've been it but like, okay, why, why did you decide not to or what? So sit down and have good, uh, good conversations and sometimes the tough conversations. I feel like that all I've read my entire life is comic books after listening to Bobby and Sammy talk about books. I feel like I just have not had a good reading, reading group. So Donnie, you want to close out here and then we we'll head to Bobby? Yeah, thank you for having me on. And uh, I think the, the, you know, the largest takeaway from today is to train and communicate, right? So um, we are going to be conditioned through training to react by habit, whether that's, and that's, you know, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it depends on what you're training on. Uh, so train on a wide variety of items. Um, and to, to follow up on what Roger said, um, the, uh, those conversations and those communications need to be had. Um, you know, as a new company officer, I, I always, you know, one of the oldest drills is going to be, you know, communic you know, putting your hood on backwards and, and, uh, and, and, you know, running a scenario through the engine bay. But I think anytime you can put yourself in a zero visibility environment and, uh, and communicate, everybody's going to be off for the better. So thank you. Why don't you, why don't you go on a call and uh, we'll let Bobby. Uh, hey, you know, what? I also like to thank John Thompson for good relief here. So 1400. <laughs> okay. I'm off the clock. All right. So. All right. All right. Chief Bobby, uh, it's all yours. You close it out. It's your show. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, 
<clears throat> and thank you. It's actually your show. And, and, and thank you, Mike, for coming with us today. Um, it was wonderful. And Sam, Sam needs your contact information, Mike. So if you could share your contact information with Sam, Sam's looking for your contact info. The, um, the company officer is just everything to me. Um, you know, it's, it's the, it's the glue that keeps us all together. And, and, you know, being a good company officer, I think the two biggest qualities for me is curiosity and, and compassion and forgiveness, right? Because one of the things we see oftentimes is that people, something bad happens and people say, well, and Mike alluded to it, everybody's talked about it earlier, but people always say, well, hold, what the hell were they thinking? Well, you don't know what they were thinking because you don't know what they were, what they thought to be true or knew to be true or, or didn't know at the time that they made those decisions. And so that's what we're talking about today. And, you know, I think that training, we can improve people's ability to recognize things like fire behavior, building construction, um, distance even, you know, which is interesting, you know, doing stretches and stuff. So I think there's a lot of skills that we can build up that help us under stress and pressure, but there's always going to be the unknown, right? The things that that the, the known unknowns, how long has this fire been burning? Are there people trapped that are going to make it tough on the fire ground, going to make it really tough? But I think that we're, 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 we've come to a point in the fire service anyway to where we've, we've gone beyond the, oh, the you know, how, how the hell did they, you know, why, why did they do that? Well, they didn't know the ending. You do. You know what I mean? It's like when you watch the YouTube uh, trolls that go after people, right, and, and, and attack people, which is just so horrible. I mean, I, 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 I fully think that, and, and I know we're on a social media platform right now, but it's really anti-social media because people jump on people for things, but they don't know what those people saw. I had two young men on the Hump Day Hangout the week before who are in a San Antonio video, but the end of the video just shows the fire when it's blowing out the windows and when they're bailing out. That fire wasn't there when they went in, but you know, everybody who commented said, what the hell were they doing in there? Well, they were trying to get the hell out of there. <laughs> you know, and so it, it was just a great uh, case study and the, the certainty of, of people to comment on, on and, and assume, you know, and, and uh, that, that, that what they know to be true is in fact true when very little of we, that we can be sure of about especially what people were experiencing or were able to, 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 to understand, which is why I struggle when people say, 85% of all accidents were, you know, human, human error. Well, no, maybe they were system design and a human was just participating in that system. And, and then we always try, tend to blame the people closest to the point, to the, to the tip of the spear, you know, not, not the guy in the puzzle palace that designed the system, you know what I mean? So, you know, you have people who are far away from the, the, you know, the, the impact and the people closest to the impact, like the pilot is always responsible for a plane crash. Well, apparently Boeing has a little responsibility with this new system they just put in those super 737s, maybe. So, you know, I just think there's, it's a great conversation. And I think that we can't train enough. We have to keep training, but we also have to keep our minds open and understand that, you know, not everybody knows everything we know in the end and not everybody, not everybody sees things the same way, which is why I think that if we can get more collaboration on the fire ground and less isolation, things will get better. And so um, hopefully we'll move forward from there. But the, a great book on this, if you wanna have a, just an absolute read, it's called Behind Human Error by Dr. David Woods. And I, I can't recommend that book any more strenuously. And, and he's a wonderful guy. If you have questions and you contact him and you tell him you're a fireman, he'll respond. He's taught at FDIC and he's considered one of the foremost leading experts on uh, cognitive neuroscience in the, in the world. So, and he's a, a wonderful, 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 wonderful human being. So thank you for your time. And thank you, Ricky, for having me as a guest on your show. It's always a pleasure and um, look forward to seeing everybody this August. My entire job is just to wrangle the cats. That's, you know, I'm just trying to keep everybody <laughs> moving here. So, so thanks to fire engineering, uh, you know, thanks to the Clarion events group for everything that they do for the fire service and for, uh, and for all of us to get to uh, express our, our views and our opinions. And, you know, 
I'm going to go to Mount Pilot and see what that fire is all about from Bill Carey. So, hey, we'll uh, see you next month. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Sammy. Thank you, Roger. And thank you, Donnie. Appreciate God, it. Everybody. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you.